Good day, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Customer Success by Design Live. I am your host, Adam Pettigord, and I am super stoked to have with me today my very special guest star, Mr. Matt Hines. How are you today, Matt? I'm great. How are you? I am good. I'm good. We are doing this during a pandemic, and I think I heard someone come downstairs to say hi. You no, know, like, so, I mean, we're doing this during a pandemic. We're doing this when all three of our kids should be in a classroom, not that far up the road, but they're not. They're here. And, you know, um, yeah, you know, this is this is what the world's like now. I once had, I was doing a recording with someone, and I, my kids were down here watching a Pokemon show, and they put it on pause, and I didn't realize that. So in the middle of the recording, Comcast pause timed out. So all of a sudden I got Pokemon going in my video and I literally had to leave the screen to go get the, the remote control. And yeah, welcome to 2020. It just, the fun continues. Yep. And that, that was me just getting up and letting my dog out as I, because they were scratching at the door. So here we are, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today, man. Everyone, we're here to talk about the power of storytelling and customer success. Very excited to have Matt here today because you are without a doubt prolific, a prolific storyteller. And I'm well, that's my assessment of you, but I'm we can talk more about it. You could tell me if you think what you think about that. But before we get to the chat, want to remind everyone that this is a live event. We want to hear from you. So please, as you're engaging and watching this on your social media channels, feel free to drop in a question for Matt or I in the question box that's available to you as they pop up. I'll make sure we get them addressed. If for whatever reason we don't get to your question in today's event, I'll make sure that we follow up with an email once this is over. Speaking of once this is over, this will be recorded and available for you to watch in perpetuity on my website, csbydesign.com or my YouTube channel. And if you have any comments that you'd like to leave, please do leave them or feel free to email them as well to info at csbydesign.com. My name is Adam Petticord. I am your host. I am also the founder of Customer Success by Design, a small agency focused on helping organizations grow their customer retention, loyalty, and satisfaction. I've been doing this for various B2B and B2C organizations and various customer success leadership roles for the past 15 plus years. My volunteer activities include being a community emergency response team member. I'm also a U.S. military combat veteran. My very special guest is the one and only Matt Hines. Matt Hines is the founder and president of Hines Marketing. For the past 20 years, he's been in marketing, business development, and sales leadership. His organization is the winner of the top most influential people in sales, lead management, and top 50 sales and marketing influencers, as well as top 50 keynote speakers. He has authored eight books and lives in a renovated farmhouse with his family and 12 pets. So the first thing I got to start with, Matt, is how do you do it all? That's a lot. Well, I married way up. Let's put it that way. Um, I've got an amazing partner. My wife has been great. Um, I think some of it is just, you know, being intentional about what's important and being focused on getting those things done, saying no to things that are distractions. Um, and the longer I live and the more mistakes I make, just, you know, figuring out like what, what, what are things that I really want my legacy to be? What are things that I really get most excited about? And, you know, I think over time, it's become like the business side is really supporting more of the personal things I care about, the the things inside and outside of our family I care about. So I know it's a very different conversation going down, but um, yeah, no, it's, it's been a lot of fun. That's awesome. Well, and speaking of the conversation that we're here to talk about today, it's storytelling and the power of it. And I found this interesting data point out there on the Harvard Business Review that said facts are 20 times more likely to be remembered if they're part of a story. So as as a professional storyteller and someone who has built a really successful business out of that, how does that data point resonate with you? I mean, actually, to be frank, I was looking for one that would be more challenging. This one seems to be more flowing into the confirming. But this is a what do you think? Small, Adam, I got to be honest. So I think, I mean, look, I and, and I think as B, I'm a B2B marketer, most of our clients are B2B companies. Like we tend to not be as good at storytelling. We tend to think we're marketing to buildings and we're not. We're marketing to people just like anybody is. And when you can tell a story, when you can tell when you, I mean, you think about like a good story that has sort of a hero, has a villain, has conflict, has intrigue, has suspense. Like when we're solving problems in the workplace, those things all exist. I can't tell you how many times, like 
I've seen speakers do this. Like there's, you know, you go to, you go to conferences or we used to go to conferences and you would see people on stage and some people would work through slides. Other people would, would give keynotes and the keynotes, the best presentations are full of stories. I mean, you go to a conference and, and, and you watch a, you watch a presenter start by saying, before I start my presentation, let me just tell you a quick story. And then take a quick pause. You will see laptops go down. You will see phones go down. People lean in because they 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 engage with stories better. Uh, some of the best business books I have read over the course of the last twenty years have been what I would call business fables. Uh, there's a there's an operating system that we're you know, introducing into our business um, called the Entrepreneur Operating System. It's called EOS, and you know there's a book called Traction. It's this book that will you know, sort of give you all the details of how the system works. There's another book called Get a Grip that the same authors wrote. It's a business fable. And that's what I've asked my team to read because it's a story that more, act more, more, I think more successfully described, not just the system, but the context into which it works. So boy, if you can take those facts and tell a story, you are going to have much more attention, much greater penetration of that story in the audience you care about. Well, what I love what you're talking about is just the, the preaching to talking to the human beings mm -hmm. at that level. And to your point, not not an inanimate object. How do you think in that room, how do you try and frame and structure a story where the audience is really big? Yeah. But try and find those words that really tie into the individual. Well, I think, you know, stories also include examples. Right. And the story you tell needs to align with kind of what your customer cares about. So just like any good marketing, it's not your story, it's the customer's story. So the better you understand who that audience is, what they care about, don't ask them what keeps them up at night, tell them what should keep them up at night. You know, be an expert, not in them and their in their job, but be an expert in your customer's problems. Because if you understand and can stack rank their problems, you tell stories about the problem. The problem is the villain, the problem is the suspense. Right. And customers, if they if they're leaning in and if they're good customers for you and if they're really good qualified prospects, it means they have not yet solved that problem. So tell stories of people that have tell stories of people that have struggled with that, that will sound familiar to those customers and to those prospects. And the better you can do that, the better you have a customer that leans in, the more attention they're going to get from you or that they're, they're going to give to you. Um, and if you tell it in a way that resonates with that audience, they're going to better understand how a potential solution could solve that problem. So talk to me a little bit. I, I, I like the villain component of that, yeah. but I, but I wonder like how, how do you set the dial about how, for, for lack of a better term, how far do you want to go to like spook them, your, your customers? Because the one thing I'm thinking about is, you know, as the customer success leader, We've already got this relationship. We're trying to grow, nurture, and develop it. The last mm -hmm. thing I intentionally want to do is scare them. But I also hear what you're saying as far as like, you you need to kind of construct something that gives them some motivation to overcome. So yeah, how do we go about thinking through that? This is not a horror movie, right? <laughs> a romantic comedy has an antagonist. I mean, if, if you don't have conflict, if you don't have sort of someone that is getting in the way between the hero and their ability to sort of finish their mission or achieve the objective or, you know, get to the promised land, then you don't have a compelling story. If it's just easy, if it's just, you know, if it's just, well, you know what? He had to go to the market. So we got in his car and he drove the car, but no, we just ran these obstacles. So I think obstacles exist. And I think if you're able, as a storyteller, if you're able to accurately articulate obstacles and antagonists, that sound familiar to your prospect, then that makes it a relevant story to your prospect. And the more, and we've seen this over the years of doing this with our clients, the better you can speak the customer's language, the better you can articulate things going on in their business, the better they think you know their business. And so, you know, we talk clients all the time that the way that you sell is more important than what you sell. Because the way, the way you're going to get someone's attention and keep their attention and build some credibility and interest with them is by telling those compelling stories. And there's been tons of research that tells us that psychologically, when we talk to someone that understands our story, that can speak our language, that understands our issues, they assume that we know that so well because we have a solution that can help them as well. So you get someone to commit to change based on the storytelling you're doing, you are the incumbent from a solutions perspective. It is your deal to lose at that point. 
Well, talk to me about that commitment uh, because I, I do believe in the power of storytelling. Um, maybe kind of just break it down for me as simplistic as you can, like how I can use some storytelling to like gain a commitment through the lens of someone who I'm already working with. And maybe that's just a silly question to ask, but I wonder how many people may just be struggling with that. Well, it's, and, I, and I think a lot of companies try to get right to the commitment, right? We want to get right to the demo. We want to assume that our prospect is going to understand the problem. And in many cases, like you think about your prospect who's crazy busy, they're trying to make homeschool work. They're getting distracted all day long. And what they are facing every day is a very simple thing called the status quo, right? Here's the systems I have. Here's the obstacles I have. Here's my focus areas. Like there's an awful lot of sameness that we face in our business internally and externally. And oftentimes we seek and are attracted to that sameness because it's familiar. Even if it is inefficient, we're attracted to it. So part of getting a commitment to change is preceded by helping a prospect see the value in a challenge to the status quo, helping them, helping, helping reframe a problem that they did or didn't know that they have, helping them articulate and calculate the cost of a problem that they did or didn't know that they have and help them see that the familiar they're, they're have in front of them that they continue to pursue is actually counterproductive to the objectives that they have. And sometimes when you do that, you are not an agreeable person. If you are introducing something that is going to get them to change, change requires pain, change is, is costly in terms of dollars or in terms of work you have to do. And so your job is not to be agreeable. Your job is to be memorable. If I introduce to you an insight that tells you you need to change something about your business, but that ultimately is going to help you be more successful, good on both of us, right? But no one is going to commit to that change unless the change is worth it. And so that reframing of the status quo is part of the story you're telling. Um, and there's plenty of literature about this. I would say The Challenger Sales, one of my favorite books, that talks about commercial insights and the reframe of the problem. If anyone listening to this does not want to read sort of a kind of wonky sales book, I would highly encourage uh, To Sell as Human by Daniel Pink. Very similar kind of a topic where, you know, we're talking about selling to people. We're talking about selling to people based on their own stories and their own issues and their status quo and the reframes that get them to think differently. Um, and there's going to be plenty of prospects that aren't committed to change because they don't want to. They just, it's too scary to get out of that status quo comfort zone. Now, that's not a short-term qualified buyer, but I think your ability to tell stories within that, um, one of the models in the challenger sale is this concept of teach, tailor, take control. And so you create a teachable moment for that prospect that teaches them something different about their business they didn't know. And you tailor that message, tailor that insight to their business, to their situation. So you're not just telling a story, you're telling their story. You're not telling them a story about someone else. You're putting them in the story. So if they can viscerally feel what they're doing today, see how different that is from where they could be, and see the difference between the, po the, 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 the outcome they're working towards today and the better positive outcome, I don't know where I'm putting hands, better positive outcome that they could be working towards if they did something differently, if they did commit to change. So, so talk to me a little bit about um, the notion of happily ever after. Does, is, is that something that should be entailed in the storytelling? Because I think that's what everybody wants, but I don't necessarily believe that's reality, which kind of flows into my second question of, you know, I think sometimes great storytelling takes us away from reality. And, you know, in business, I think a lot of times we have to face the reality. I mean, we have to be talked about the pandemic we're living in now. So, so how do we, how do we get to the reality of happily ever after without it just being myth-making for lack of a better term? Well, um, I mean, a story doesn't always have a happy ending. A story doesn't always have a happily ever after. I mean, it's a nice, it's a fairy tale, right? Um, but I think there's a point at which that kind of fiction isn't realistic in a B2B or in a business storytelling capacity. Um, very rarely, at least in the work that we do, very rarely once you get someone to a particular outcome is that the end of, is that at the end of a des of a journey and a destination. Oftentimes, it's a point in the journey. Like your market is gonna to continue to evolve, your business is gonna to continue to evolve, your customers are gonna evolve. And look, what, what is a status quo today that you decided was getting you to where you are today? At one point in time, that was the that was the destination. That was the change that you put in place that put you on a better trajectory. I right? the point is that all those things that we're doing may have started out as being positive, but may no longer be working as effectively as they did before. Or there's new variables 
that exist in your market amongst your customers in your business that change the chemistry of the business, that change what's working and what's not. So I think it's really dangerous. I mean, we see a lot of companies say like, oh, we bought this tool and we put it in place and now it's set it and forget it and we're good. Or, you know, we solve this culture problem and now we never have to think about it again. Really dangerous thinking to say like, okay, this is done forever. Um, Cause I think that leads to further sort of blindness of status quo that actually need revisiting and changing. Well, I love the fact that you just brought up tools there because I'd like to talk about that for a moment because we already talked a little bit about how do you reach an audience in kind of the traditional sense of let's let's assume we we're back in the day where we're now living in a pandemic and we all can be in a nice big room and just chat openly. But now we've got all these channels. We're all trying to tell different stories um, through these channels. What do you find is the most effective way to leverage those channels to tell a story? Well, I think it depends a little bit on sort of where you are in the relationship with a customer. You know, I mean, if you want a lot of time with someone, you better have a good relationship so they're willing to invest that amount of time. Uh, I think you have to understand who the audience is and what what formats they're likely to engage in. Um, you know, I think that we have certainly seen a, a proliferation this year, not only in video and live video like this, but also in podcasts. Um, you know, we thought at the beginning of the pandemic that podcasts were going to see a bit of a decline because, you know, we lost our commutes. But people, even though people lost commutes, they still need downtime. We're seeing more people going for walks around the neighborhood. We're seeing more people just sort of just go sit in their front porch and try to get away for a little bit. Right. And so, you know, podcast business podcasts continue to be successful. Um, just storytelling podcasts. There's a there's a there's a podcast I listen to. It's like a rewatch and a episode by episode podcast of The Office from a couple people that were actors on The Office. Um, it's exploded because it's a little bit of escapism for people. So, um, you know, I think that you, you, the, your interest in particular channels is as important as how well you understand your audience and the type of content they're interested in, the format they're predisposed to pay attention to, and your ability to sort of build an audience over time. Um, we've been doing a podcast for five years. So listen, <laughs> it takes a while to sort of build, some, build some trust. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, but if you're consistent in format, if you're consistent in approach, and you can build a body of work um, that provides value, I think you can get some real traction. So talk to me a little bit, of, I think, about um, maybe that sense of urgency component and how it can mm -hmm. impact effective storytelling. Because I, I wonder, like, a lot of businesses may not have the freedom right now, or the, they're, they're under such duress that they're thinking, we have to hit it. We have to hit it hard. We're going to have to place some strategic bets on maybe this will ruffle more feathers than we want, or maybe they're just throwing it out the window to see what sticks. Yeah. Um, what 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 do you think to, or what would you say to businesses out there that are like, okay, Matt, I hear you on the storytelling, but I don't have the time to build a narrative or relationship like that to nurture that along. Uh, at the risk of getting meta, um, what do you have time for? You know, what you're doing today with your time, is that your status quo? And is that really working? Look, if I come and tell you that I think I believe in the power of storytelling and I think better stories can help you sell and help you better sort of translate your message into needs and emotion and kind of create that struggle, like identify and articulate who the antagonist is and help a prospect see a better future for themselves. Like, I think that better storytelling is going to help you get better sales. If you're getting, if you're selling enough today, if you have enough pipeline today, if you whatever you're doing today is getting your prospects in, you know, in and making your customers successful, then I don't have anything to sell. You, right. But I think it's really important if you step back and say, OK, why are we, we're not doing this because we want to be better storytellers. We're doing this because of an outcome that that represents. And so if you feel like that outcome, if you feel like your ability to engage your prospects, your ability to create understanding and urgency amongst your prospects to do something different. If you have a better way of doing it, if it's working for you today, then great. I may not be able to compel you to think about something differently, but it's that outcome you got to think about. It's that challenging of the status quo. It's that ability to say, is it really working? Are you really on track? Like if I see you at a, at a networking event, you say, I ask you how business is going. You're like, oh, it's going great. Most people know it's not. The building's on fire. I think I'm just, I don't know if I'm going to make it until the end of the year. Like, or, you know, like it's the beginning of September and I'm really worried about my pipeline for this quarter. I mean, are you sure? And so some of that is if you, if you cold call a prospect or someone's watching this video, <clears throat> they may be like, yeah, no, my house is on fire, but I don't know you and I don't trust you. And I'm not willing to tell you that yet. 
So <clears throat> helping someone see a challenge or status quo is one thing. Building the trust between you and building a relationship such that they trust you enough to be vulnerable in sharing some of those challenges and admitting that, yeah, things aren't as good as I want them to be or I want you to think that they are. You know, and that's not something that's going to happen in a 20 minute video. It's not something that's going to happen in a 200 word email. It's not something that's going to happen in a cold call with a 20 year old that you don't, you've never heard of before. So I think there is that body of work that, you know, even if they haven't talked to you before, they've seen a bunch of these videos. Like they start to be familiar with you. They start to believe in your story. They start to think that, listen, I've seen and heard and read enough of his message that this, this makes sense. And I like the way he thinks and he seems to be pretty articulate and pretty empathetic. Maybe I can share where I actually am with this. Maybe I can be a little vulnerable and say, no, things aren't going as well as I, as I wanted them to. Well, what's interesting about that response is it still kind of it makes me feel like I think what I hear you're talking about is you're going back to, again, to that building that relationship and, and sticking kind of with that, that mantra and that approach. So what I'd like to work, ask you about is how do you then think through, sorry, the dog's back. Um, Bye. The, how do you think through planting those little productive kernels of within the storytelling that kind of move it along for those outcomes? Because, you know, it, you talked openly there about like, we're, tr we're not telling a story just to tell a story. We're telling a story because we're trying to get an outcome, a, hopefully an outcome that's good for the customer and good for us as well, too. How do you think of through planting those kernels along the way so we keep moving along with those outcomes? Well, um, as, as important as it is to tell the prospect story, as important as it is to make the, the story relevant to that to each prospect and person you're talking to, one of the ways you make that relevant, one of the ways you help them become comfortable with sharing their stories by showing them other people that have been down that path, right? Like give examples of other companies and other businesses and other individuals that in the past and recent past have exhibited that vulnerability, have gone through that channel, have gone through some of that struggle. I mean, if your message of challenging the status quo, if, if your message of helping someone see their business differently is purely theoretical, if you don't have actual real life examples to share, then how is someone going to trust that this thing actually lands? Like, I think I don't need theory. I don't need ivory tower analysts telling me what I should do. I want someone telling me what's actually happened in the marketplace, right? I mean, this is why, you know, if professional services about to close the deal, they're like, hey, can we talk to other people that have worked with you? Can we talk to other people that have had this situation? that have addressed it, even if they haven't been 100% successful, like, do they buy into the process? Do they see, you know, the benefit this could have? Like, it, it, it's kind of typical. It's, it's, it's not that different than thinking about sort of those end of, end of sales process conversations around justifying the decision. How do I increase confidence that this is something that might actually work? Um, so I think figuring out how to combine telling the prospect story and making the prospect feel like they're part of the story, while also helping them understand that they're not the first to go through this. The fact that they may be at the beginning of this journey and feel like because they're staring at the same four walls and they've got it and they've never done this before, that this is unique and this is scary. But if you can tell them you've seen this movie before, right, and that you've seen a lot of people in their role at similar companies have experienced the same challenges, the same fears, the same problems like that, that journey, you know, that that journey that the hero was going through and facing adversity, a lot of your peers have been going through that. And over time, those that made these couple critical decisions in the middle of the movie are those that get to the end and are successful versus those that keep the status quo and continue to grind and struggle. So you talked a lot about right there about kind of going against the status quo and um, giving giving that new prospect kind of a moment to see that, oh, you're someone who I can trust and follow along the way. Mm -hmm. But what if we're talking about someone who has trusted you? You've brought them into your fold. They've been in the fold. And now we've got at, to that point where the message feels the same and repetitive. You know that. You want to bring forth a new message. You want to try to tell a new story. How would you recommend people think about breaking in a new story or a new story to someone who's kind of been with you for a while and you know you got to change it up? How would you How would you recommend going down that path? Well, a couple of ways. There's a macro and a micro way to do that. The macro is to sort of really be in touch with the way that their industry is changing. If there are different variables in their space, like if you had a conversation with someone in January about something that was going to help their business, how is that conversation different now that people are working from home, that maybe their industry has been affected, that maybe they've got less budget, that now all of a sudden, 
you know, instead of five priorities they need to tackle, they've got one or two because their 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 bandwidth and their budget requires that. I think you can also just look to changes for that individual over time and things that have happened differently for them. What's happened in their business? What's happened in their career? What are the things they're discussing? What are the things they're sharing? If you look at a particular buyer or a prospect's social feed, you're going to get all kinds of clues of how things have changed, right? I mean, I can go, I can go on LinkedIn right now and I can I can do a search, show me all the CMOs in Seattle that I'm the first connection with and show me those that have posted something on LinkedIn in the last 90 days. And it's gonna be a subset of the overall group, but the things they're posting give me evidence of the things that they care about, right? And things going on in their business, if I do the same thing, show me updates from their company. What have they been announcing? What's been disclosed? Where have they been in the press? What's been talked about? There are other clues of how to make that story personal, make it relevant, but also make it timely to what's going on right now. Um, and you know, you can do that in a macro environment based on industry you know, trends going on in an industry or maybe even a region, but even more valuable if you can make it very personal to that person, to that prospect, to their role and to their company. Well, what I love about your recommendation there is just you, you're telling people, I think, to go put your detective hat on and not just sit idly by and assume. And I wonder, I wonder too, you know, because again, bringing it back to customer success, you, we've got these relationships. And I think that a lot of times, uh, sometimes customers just don't want to be that open and transparent. And so you have to go do some extra detective work to kind of get a new narrative out of them. Uh, do you have any other thoughts about how you can maybe get people to maybe share a little bit more because I think everybody kind of faces the same challenge where you you want to write the story, but you can never quite get all the information you need to make it quite as compelling to them. Is there value in just declaring that and saying, hey, I don't know the full scope of what's going on with you? Yeah, I think you can. I think you can say, listen, like, here's what I've seen. Here's what I see. Here's what I typically see under, you know, sort of under the covers or inside the business when I see these external pieces of evidence. Like, and, and just by saying, here's what I usually see, I mean, someone would be like, how did you know that? Were you listening to my last meeting? And so those initial points of credibility can demonstrate your expertise and get someone willing to open up to you. Um, your ability to show how you have helped other people along that process certainly helps. So having a published rec recording or published documentation of someone else's story so they can see what it might be like, so they can see and feel and hear what it might be like to have that conversation. Some of it's just a matter of building trust over time, right? I mean, I think, you know, I think you can, a seller who wants to take that sort of challenger model and provide commercial insights and sort of push the thinking of their customer, like you can do that in a respectful way. It is a hell of a lot easier to have that conversation if you already have some trust, if they feel like you've already leaned into the relationship. And, you know, that just takes time, right? I mean, it takes time to build that. You're not going to get that in the first email. But if you take the time to do that by proving that you understand their business, by sharing content that is relevant to them, by being proactive at thinking about what they're looking at, by responding to things that they're talking about, and then showing them other relevant stories from other companies, those are things that may not like e sort of immediately fast forward the conversation, but they can certainly be catalysts to moving you from being sort of unknown to someone who's trusted, to make you, you know, go from being interruptive to being irresistible, where people want to spend more time with you because they feel like they're learning and benefiting from that. I love I love that going from being interruptive to irresistible. That's, that's a good one. I don't, I've never heard that one before. That's a good one. So um, uh, brass tacks, break it down for me. Like how, how can I, and maybe this is a very simplistic question, but like how can I tell if I'm even a good storyteller or not? Like, like how, how do I measure it? I mean, are you keeping someone's attention? Are they still listening? Um, are you building an audience? Are they coming back? Um, you know, one of my favorite speakers on this is Drew Davis. He's um, he's based in Florida and he, well, as of last year, he was doing a lot of keynote speaking. I'm not sure exactly what he's doing right now, but um, he, he talks a lot about this sort of curiosity factor. And he says, people will continue to read and continue to pay attention and will continue to listen if they still have questions. If you're telling a story that has not answered all of their questions, if they've stopped paying attention, if they've stopped listening, they no longer have questions. Either they know all the information they need to have or they're not interested in the story enough to keep paying attention. 
And so, you know, I think it's important that, you know, if people are like, listen, like the more I listen to Seth God and the more I read of his stuff, like it's always good. It's consistently valuable. If I keep this video going um, of a particular analyst, like I just know that there's going to be more good stuff back there. I mean, that's that's a question. The, one of the questions is, what's he going to say next? What is she going to share in the next five minutes that might be valuable? If you don't have interesting things to say, if all you're doing is providing a demo, if all you're doing is talking about yourself, I don't have any more questions and I'm busy and I'm distracted and Pokemon's on now. So we're going to go over here and do something else. Right. And so, you know, we're not only like you're like, again, like it's, it's somewhat there's a parallel here to sort of getting someone to commit to change. The commitment to change and the path and the pain that represents had better be more valuable and more compelling than just going back to whatever you were doing. Um, you know, in, in the sales process, you see a lot of prospects not close. And in many cases, prospects don't, you know, don't go away because they've chosen another solution. In many cases, they just choose nothing. And if your prospect goes through the process of looking at solutions and saying, yeah, I'm committed to change and I want to do something. And then all of a sudden they decide to do nothing. They have actually not committed to change. Something may have changed. There may be a new variable that makes them say this is not worth it right now. And your job as a seller is to make sure someone understands and stays committed to that process. And if you haven't made that strong enough case, either you need to re work harder to communicate that in a more effective way or realize that it's not a short term qualified prospect and walk away. I think that's I think that's an interesting place for us to, to pivot, because, you know, in in customer success, we really can't walk away. We, we've got them, our mission and our charters to keep them happy, healthy and around forever which is why I keep wondering around, okay, so how do we keep, how do we keep the story fresh? How yeah. do we keep the story going? Um, how do we know when it's not resonating anymore? Um, and I know you've talked about this before, but maybe if you could just advise us on just its simplest form, like if you're a new customer success leader and you, you're walking in and you're thinking about it through the lens of, I know I've got to keep them. I know that I need to provide compelling and interesting value add to keep growing the accounts we're, we're not really doing this well right now where would you have them kind of start their thinking about building a story that kind of moves in those towards those outcomes i think first you want to establish a reputation of being someone that is consistently providing insights and value that when i talk to you i get ideas i get inspiration you bring a filtered, edited, curated voice of the industry and voice of the real issues to me to help me understand not just what those key issues are, but how it relates to me. I think also the better you understand who your audience is, the better you understand your customer and their problems, the better you can ask your customers questions that they don't know the answer to, where the question itself gets them to think differently about a problem. And this is that this is where, you know, I think, you know, if you're a seller and you're simply asking customers to answer questions they already know the answers to, then that seems like a waste of the prospect's time. Now, you're just trying to arm yourself by wasting my time so you can turn that around and sell to me. But if you're asking me questions about a problem that I did or didn't know that I have, if you're asking me to sort of think about something in a different light that I hadn't thought about before, then that sort of that in and of itself is worth the time. Like we tell sellers, like if you get on the phone with a prospect, First of all, first conversation you have with the prospect, unless they ask about it, don't talk about your product or service. And so if talking about yourself is off the table, what, what are you going to talk about? What questions are you going to ask? And then what insights and conversation can you have that after 15, 20, 30 minutes, the prospect gets off the phone and says, that was really useful. I would have paid for that. Like what interactions, again, that whole idea of going from interruptive to irresistible, how do you make that interaction, interaction something that people value that highly? And the better you understand the prospect and their issues and their problems, the better you can understand how that relates to a theme and a, a consistent set of problems and antagonists that people in their space, in their industry, in their role have. If you can help them see where they sit relative to their peers and get out of those same four walls and actually see the trends in the industry that are happening and say, listen, my friend, things are changing from the way we all set this up X years ago. And there are going to be winners and losers based on those that adjust to these changes, which side you want to be on. And here are the variables. Here are the insights that are going to help companies figure out which side is the winning side and which side is the losing side. Now, all of a sudden, I'm interested. Right Now, all of a sudden, I'm like, are there factors I don't know about? Are there factors that I didn't realize were as important? 
is the industry changing more than I thought it was? Are there things that I'm blind to that if I actually paid attention, I could be better at making the adjustments in my business to help it stay on track? Like, what are those things? What do you see that I don't see, right? Now I wanna know more, right? I'm still listening. What do you think about the involvement of data and imagery in effective storytelling? And the reason I ask is because, you know, I've certainly dealt with, and I know you have as well too, certain personas which are just, just speak speak to me in numbers. And other personas are like highly visual. Um, do, you, do you find in your experience one outperforms the other or is it more nuanced? I mean, it's an and, not an either or. You know, I think that, you know, visuals are valuable if they tell a story. Sometimes if it's just a, if it's just a stock footage of like a, stereotypical CFO, that doesn't necessarily do anything for me. If I think about that concept before of from the challenger model of sort of the teach and tailor, teaching often has to do with some kind of trend data, some kind of math, right? That says, did you know that, you know, 40 of the 50 top companies in your industries have actually have abandoned this software that everyone thought they had to have? You want to know why they're doing that? You want to know why many of the leading companies that are actually, the, you know, the of the companies that are actually doing better in 2020 than they did in 2019, did you know they were four times more likely to be doing this in the market? Four times more likely to have pivoted away from in-person events to what? You know, and what is that? What is what are they doing? What are they doing differently? So I think having some some metrics and having really sort of hard evidence around that can really help. But if you can tailor that to the organization, it helps even more. Like before I started my business, I worked at a clean tech company and. You know, we were selling, you know, power management software and, you know, we were able to tell people like, hey, listen, like we know that about 40 percent of the energy PCs used power them when they're not in use. You walk over the way to the bathroom, you go to lunch, you go home at night, you go on a weekend vacation. It's still your computers are still working like your monitors, your desktop is back when there's desktops, monitors, desktops, printers all still used. And we, our expectation in an enterprise environment is that we can ex, that we had a percentage of that energy we thought we could actually save for a company. So there's a teachable moment that says a lot of this energy is being wasted. There's a percent of this with better management you no longer have to pay for. So like you're paying a power bill that can actually be smaller or kind of smaller. So there was a bank that had about 65,000 PCs across North America. We did a pilot test of a handful of their PCs and we were able to come back and say, listen, based on this math, if you see the average, a conservative average from across a bunch of other com a bunch of other banking customers, we expect your power bill could be twenty three thousand dollars a day less. Twenty three thousand. So now we did a teachable moment and we tailored it to their company, right? I mean, this is storytelling, right? So now I can, I'm not just going to the CIO and saying like your PCs could be more efficient. We're not just going to the real estate manager and say your power bill could be lower. I don't care how big or small your business is. Twenty three thousand dollars a day straight to the bottom line, I got a CFO that wants that yesterday. Can you put that in place before my next earnings call? Because I want to take 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 that take, uh, take credit for that and tell that story. Um, and, you know, this is back in the day when this is pre-recession, when, you know, a lot of companies were also making carbon reduction goals. And so to be able to say you're reducing your energy usage by X amount, and that's putting you closer or making a material uh, progress towards your carbon neutral goal, like there are other objectives there. That's a story that a company is trying to tell, not only around cost savings, but being a good corporate citizen, being someone, a brand that people trust and want to work with. And that's, you know, we'll take every advantage we can to get new customers. So there's all those different angles of stories that start with the math, but start with that teach and tailorable moment. Last question for you, I think. <laughs> But I'm curious, so you, you've already shared some great tips around authors that you like and have read. Now I'm curious, um, does Matt Hines have a top five companies or organization that he says, these companies do storytelling right? If you wanna just, if you wanna see storytellers in action, go look at these guys. Um, you know, I would say, I mean, obviously, I mean, you know, it's easy to say companies like Apple do a really nice job uh, with storytelling. Um, I actually think in the B2B space, I think HubSpot has done a really nice job of storytelling. Um, there's a company called uh, Sixth Sense uh, in, the, in the marketing technology side. I think they've done a really nice job of, of, of telling stories. Um, you know, I would say, you know, the, the CEB, you know, who is now, who is, was bought by Gartner, you know, the analyst firm. Um, but they were really good at telling stories. Um, you know, they would get up, you know, on stage at their conferences and, 
you know, not just rattle through analyst reports and research, but they would they would bring it to life by talking about the customers behind it and what they were doing. And it was very clear that, you know, you had a much more rapt attention from the audience. People, you know, didn't just wait in the lobby to hope, you know, to, to hope for the breakouts to start. They were listening to those those messages. Um, so, I, you know, I think there's a wide variety. Of, I mean, you, sometimes we think about storytelling. We think about oh, you got these consumer brands and it's much more interesting and they're doing 30 second TV spots. Like, oh, I mean, there's some pretty there are some really interesting B2B companies. Um, some of the just, they sell boring marketing software, but they bring it to life by talking about the impact that it has. Your response made me think of one more question. So I'm sorry, I lied to you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I'm curious because I think, you know, just hearing you talk so passionately and confidently about storytelling just makes me think that it is, it is as much of a skill as it is an art. So whom do you think of as kind of the persona or the profile that businesses should think of as, hey, we should really look to this type of an individual to help us craft or discover what our story is and how we should tell it. Is there, because I think businesses kind of get a little bit hung up on who should own it. And I don't know if this is something where it's where, yeah, you should look over here or if it's no, just give it the marketing and let them run. Um, honestly, I, I think that, I would look to some of the most popular TED talks that you see. I mean, I, and I think that this is where you can sort of let the crowd sort of identify what's working. If you look at some of the most popular TED talks, it's not just because of the topic or 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 message. It's also the way it was delivered. Um, and so I think if you study people that have done this well, um, you know, there's a great book many people probably read called Presentation Secrets of Steve Jobs. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of really great tactics in that book that honestly. Um, um, you know, the new CEO uses a lot. If you look at a lot of the Apple keynotes over time, they don't use the words I and we very often. Like go count the number of times in an Apple keynote, the word you is you. They're talking to you, right? And there's, 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 a, there's, there's some really, really deep, powerful, embedded psychology around when we want to listen to stories where we feel like we're part of it, where we feel like we're, we're relevant to it. Um, and you can, and, and, and you're listening to something because you understand even inherently the impact it can have on you. So I would say go watch, you know, both old and new Apple keynotes. Go check out some of the more popular um, uh, TED Docs, and you're going to see some great examples of very relevant, very personal storytelling. Great recommendation. Thank you, Matt. So we're kind of at the point now where we're going to start wrapping up because I think. Um, we've asked, I could, I know I could ask you a lot more, but I got to be respectful of your time and I know you got much to do. So this is kind of the takeaway section for anybody who's paying attention and who's everybody's been watching along. So Matt, feel free to chime in on any of these if you like, but we've talked a little bit. And one of the things that I think we talked about is communicating with context. You know, I've heard you, Matt, talk a lot about, um, make it about the end user, but I think that's super important when people think about storytelling and what resonates well with users. Um, we talked a little bit about data, but not just any kind of data, but relevant data. I think relevancy to your point, Matt, spot, speaks to uh, the individual that you're actually talking to, making it about them and not about you. I like this one, uh, ruthlessly edit to provide real meaning. Um, I, I think there's a lot of off the cuffness, I don't, but I actually, I don't know, Matt, you know, I think authenticity is so big right now. How does that one resonate with you still today? Um, oh, I, I, I think, you know, Mark Twain once said, if I had more time, I would have written a shorter letter, you know? So I do think, you know, editing is really, really important. I think we all tend to be way more wordy than we should. Um, and you know, when you're in, even when you're in a live environment like this, it's easy just to sort of just keep talking, but you're going to lose people's attention. So your ability to even sort of self-edit in the moment, I mean, that's a skill that takes a long time to figure out. But I 100% believe in this. Uh, that the tighter, more efficient your message is, uh, the better your story. I also like this one, visuals are your friend. I asked you specifically what you thought about it, and I like how you framed it as they're an and. Um, mm -hmm. They're not necessarily the story there. And then finally, just making your customer part of the story, getting back to that individual um, and the individual needs there. 
Uh, any other comments you'd like to make on the takeaways there, Matt, for the no, audience? No, I, I think these are really good. I'm glad you ended with the make the customer part of the story. I mean, honestly, I think that is hopefully a recurring theme you've heard in the last 45 minutes that, you know, you can have a compelling story, but if your customer doesn't care, if they don't see how it relates to them, if they don't see themselves in some way in that story, uh, I don't think you're going to be very successful in keeping that. Thanks, Matt. So this is the part in the journey here where I want to talk to everybody about just we've had some jokes and some fun about uh, how the stream has gone because of the pandemic. We've had kids jump in, dogs jump in, you name it. And so we're all dealing with this thing. And if you want to go out and provide some blood, sweat and tears to combat the virus, here are some organizations that I've found that will readily take you and your abilities, whether it be through blood donation, PPE creation or food donation. I know, Matt, I know you and your family are very active in volunteerism and in uh, the giving community. Is there any nonprofit in general that you'd just like to give a shout out to here? There's a couple that I think are particularly relevant right now. One is uh, called Christian Vet Mission. Um, it basically, it's, it's, it's veterinarians that are volunteering their time in third world countries around the world just to take care of people's pets and animals. And uh, it's something you don't really think about, um, but there's an awful lot of pets that are really important to families um, that don't have the means of getting proper vet care. And so that's one. The other one that really run right now, and I'm a, I mean, I'm a trained journalist. I studied journalism. I wrote for newspapers early in my career. Uh, the Marshall Project uh, does a really nice job of supporting journalism that supports criminal justice and sort of, sort of identifies things that need to be resolved and really sort of fights for racial equity and, and, and social racial justice as well. So those are a couple that I like a lot. Thanks, Matt. I'll make sure to post those on the uh, record uh, on the website as well. So for those who are interested in learning more about how you can support Black Lives Matter, uh, these have been helpful links for me as I've been working through that with my family and I offer them up to you. And then finally, just a reminder to get out there and register as vote. You can go to USA.gov or the US Vote Foundation to find out how voting registration works in your city and neighborhood. I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. If you have any additional questions for Matt or I, please go ahead and send them to info at csbydesign.com and we'll make sure to respond accordingly. And then finally, please join me next week with my very special guest, Mr. Dave Wilner, as we talk about creating better customer outcomes, what creates better customer outcomes, leading with employee or customer first mentality, and the one and only Melissa Van Buehler on how to communicate recurring value of seasonal solutions to customers. Matt, I can't thank you enough for your time and your energy today and just for being on the stream. It's been a lot of fun. This has been awesome. It's great to be able to do this with you. Um, super excited to see you and your business continue to grow and, and thrive in this environment. Thank you, Ivana and others who are watching this live. It's, it's been fun. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.